Wow, four people online, cool. That means three of our kids aren't online. What's up with that? Just kidding. I have to stare at my picture. Oh well, whatever. So thank you very much for that introduction. I am pleased to be here. It's a little um a little nerve wracking speaking in front of a lot of government officials as a member of the journalism group. And I guess the first question I would have is, how many of you in here think that journalists are kind of a pain in the butt? Raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, that's all. No. I'm kind of here to defend my craft a little bit, but I want to start by telling a story that um, I've told many times before about something that happened to me my freshman year in college. Now, I went to college in California for one year, and then I transferred back here to go to school. And in that English freshman, freshman English class that I was in, it was a your typical college class, kind of an amphitheater type. You know what I'm talking about? The professor was down on the bottom of the stage. Not unlike this, except we didn't have the, the, uh, the wings here. I walked in not knowing what to expect about my English class at all, and um, about two minutes after the class was to start, and everybody was kind of hushed in their seats, the professor walked in. Now, very few people in this room are as old as I am, but perhaps some of you remember a TV show called The Paper Chase. It starred a gentleman named, an actor named John Hausman. He was a classic actor, kind of a uh, big, a burly, gray-haired, slightly bent-over guy who would come into class, a very rough voice. Near the end of his career, he would do, I think he did commercials for E.F. Hutton when people cared about Wall Street investment companies. And uh, this guy came in and he kind of looked like, uh, like Mr. Huntsman. So he walked to the front of the stage, front of the classroom. He had a huge, huge binder in his hand. It looked like a, the thickest thing you can imagine. He took it and he pounded it down on the, on the podium. So Bear with me here. I'm going to try to imitate that first day of English class and the first words he uttered. What is education? Yeah, same reaction we had. <laughs> Nobody said a thing. He says, come back on Wednesday when you know the answer. And he left. Sounds intimidating. I thought, okay, very dramatic, nice, nice touch. So Wednesday, he came in again. Same MO, same shtick. What is education? Now, unfortunately for this one particular freshman, it wasn't me, sitting about the third row, he actually tried to answer that question. He said, education is learning the times, dates, places. Wrong! Come back with you know. He's gone. This is great. My first two days of college English have lasted less than four minutes. I'm going to get a credit for doing nothing. This is great. But on the third day, he didn't come in late, and he didn't come in and pound the podium. And he came in much softer, and he said, what, my friends, is education? There was no way anybody was going to answer this question. We saw what happened to the guy on Wednesday. He said, education is not the memorization of dates, historic sites, famous names, elements on the periodic chart, math formulas. No, 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 no. Education, my friends, is problem solving. And the way you solve problems is through communications. So that's the gist of what I'm going to talk about a little bit here. I'm going to talk about the news industry. I'm going to talk about why, for some of you, we have become a pain. And I apologize for people who have abused the power that we have as members of the public with grammar requests and other requests to try to get information. The word news is interesting. I always thought for the longest time it was created by the fact that if you had one thing that was new and another thing that was new, you would put them together, you would have two news. But actually, news refers to the points of the compass, north, east, west, and south. In other words, news is what happens all around us, just like the points of the compass. And unfortunately, 
New Year's is the exception to the rule. One of the things that we're often accused of as journalists is that you always put bad news in the paper. You've heard the, are there any other journalists in here, by the way? Just out of curiosity, a couple of you, okay. Oh yeah, that's right, you're a journalist, I know that. But. There's a cliche that says, oh, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. That's what all you do, you dwell on the negative and blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? With rare exception, that's the exception to the rule. Be grateful that the headline in tomorrow's daily paper isn't, for first time in months, no drive-by shootings in Kearns. Be glad that's not the headline. Be glad the headline tomorrow isn't, all flights landed safely at Air Ports are not the And I think what we should do, in the purest sense of journalism, is to tell stories that do make a difference in people's lives. Tell them what they want to know. Now, I was pointed to the State Records Committee. I've been on there about 18 months, and I love the comments from the, uh, the, the roundtable, the, the panel that we had earlier. Uh, some things I noted here, I'm going to try to read this without glasses, but I can't, because even though this is a grandma conference, you're being speaking as a grandpa. So that's the way it goes. If you think about um, a government, a country that's in chaos, when somebody decides to overthrow a government, besides taking the leaders and imprisoning them or doing whatever else they do, what else do they seize? The TV stations, the radio stations, the newspapers. And they probably go after the banks and they probably go after the petroleum companies. But regardless of the economy of a country, they're definitely going to go after the media. And the reason for that is simple. If you control the information that a populace gets, you can control the thought process. And we've seen it over and over and over again. Whether it's a small uh, uh, fundamentalist group of, of religious fanatics somewhere, whether it's a, uh, you know, an organization that has some other ulterior motive, they just want to be able to control the thoughts of people. And they do that by seizing the media. If you get information from the source that they prefer, and that's the only source you get, you're going to be subject to, to, to kind of believe what they're saying. That's a big problem. So um, having said those things, let's talk about grandma, which was the source of your conference today. And, and from what I understand, were, you know, from what I gathered from when I first walked in here for the, uh, the panel, it's been very well attended. You did have a lot of followers online. A lot of people found out I was closing and left, and that's fine. So, but the ones over here are eligible for the door prize. Just kidding, there is no door prize. So because I'm in journalism and there's no money for a door prize. So, Grandma was created by the state legislature in um, 1991. It was intended, and I'm going to read what it says here on the, uh, the archives website, intended to balance the public's constitutional right to access information, individual privacy rights, and government's interest in restricting access to some records. Note that, and, and I know this was brought up earlier, that refers to government records. And I'm going to talk about text messaging here in a little while. And I was thinking to myself, I can't grandma the text messages you're all sending to each other right now about me. Because most of you are not working in government capacity. I guess some of you are, but I won't do it anyway. So in 1992, the State Records Committee was formed and began being organized. I don't recall too much about when uh, grandma was created here. I don't recall too much about when the State Records Committee was was here in 1991-1992. I wasn't really living in the real world then. I was living in, in, uh, in Utah County. It's a joke. I went to BYU, I can make that joke. So, um, What is the purpose of the State Records Committee? Well, we meet at least quarterly, which by the way, I think is amusing when I read that because in 17 or 18 months, I think we've met every month. And there are times when we ponder whether we could meet more than once a month because so many appeals are before us. We talk about retention schedules. That's something that was brought up earlier. And, and I know that uh, some of you referred to the fact that your retention schedules and your, and your entities uh, ne not necessarily near the state, but we talk about retention schedules every month. We're talking about those. And of course, the biggest thing we do as a state records committee is to hear appeals of requests for information that are denied. And I know you've heard about that all day long. But let's go back to grandma for a minute. By the way, despite what David Fleming said, 
This is not necessarily very interesting reading. <laughs> and he says, you can read this in an hour or two. Yeah, not if you really want to read it. It's a very long document. And as he said, after four years of being on the State Records Committee, he knows a lot of this by heart. I do not. I'm not a grammar expert. So that's not, hopefully not what you wanted me to talk about today was my expertise in grammar. I learn something every, every month. New references, uh, new particular sub chapter, particle, subsection, whatever, you know. Seriously, you ought to hear, yes, you ought to hear somebody refer to these for the record. It's just 63G694432, you know, it sounds like it's unbelievable. But grammar worked very well, really well, I thought, from what I've read, for 20 years. There were some hiccups, there were some things that needed to be changed, but by and large, it did what it was accomplished, it did what it was supposed to do. It made records transparent. It allowed the public to know what was going on with their government officials. That was in 1991 and 1992, and everything sailed along perfectly, and it was all beautiful, and we were singing Rainbow Connection and all those things. And then 2011 happened, and the five most notorious letters and numbers in Utah transparency history, transparency history came up. HB 477. You've probably discussed this before in your, in your uh, conferences. I don't know if you have or haven't. This was an 11th hour, and I mean an 11.45 p.m., to use the analogy, effort to drastically change grandma. It caught all of us by surprise. It was discussed and pretty much steamrolled through the legislature. There were some outcries. Let me tell you about the night it passed. I'm a child of the 60s and 70s. I grew up in California. I remember the protests on the campus of the University of California at Berkeley. I remember sit-ins. I remember those things. Well, we didn't go quite that far. But let me describe what happened that night at the Utah State Capitol. It was a windy night, and on the plaza back behind the Capitol building, there was a podium that was set up. And a number of people were asked to speak that night. I was one of them because at that time I was president of the Utah chapter of an organization called the Society of Professional Journalists, SPJ. Everything to do with open meetings and transparency we discussed. But there were a lot of... There were people who were, you know, just in, in groups. And I said, if they start singing Kumbaya, it will remind me of the 60s. It will remind me of what it was like in Berkeley. Well, they didn't. But they did start singing If I Had a Hammer by Peter, Paul, and Mary. And I honestly thought for a moment I had, had stepped into a time machine, found Michael J. Fox's DeLorean, and gone backwards instead of forwards. It was amazing how much of a bonding experience this protest was. After that spill of about 45 minutes, a group of us walked into the Capitol, and in the uh, rotunda there, there were huge groups. The, the legislature was all behind closed doors discussing this bill, amongst other things they had to do on closing night, because there's a lot of things they had to do. They have to pass a budget, and that always gets pushed off to the end, which is just the way it is in all state legislatures. And um, despite the, the public outcry, it passed. It went to the governor. The governor signed it a couple of days later. There was a lot of urging that he wouldn't, he did anyway. For the first time in its history, the Salt Lake Tribune ran an editorial about it on the front page of their paper. It passed. And suddenly, the eyes of the nation literally were on Utah. CNN sent someone out to cover the event. David Collier, who at that time was the FOI, Freedom of Information Chairman for SPJ, professor at the University of Arizona, found out that our chapter was going to present a black hole award to the legislature and the governor. We went out, bought a very cheap homemade wreath of some kind at Michael's probably, spray painted it black, and Collier says, I want to be part of this presentation, and he was. He flew up from, Fender, from Tucson. He literally was with us. We went up and we presented it on the Capitol steps. And while he was in town, every TV station interviewed him. The question was whether or not it mattered. 
that the public was was irate about this. And I don't think anybody really thought that the public would be irate about it, but they were. National publicity, local publicity, lots of pressure, threats of a petition to take to uh, put it on the ballot or to have the governor call a special session to vote on it and possibly overturn it, and it happened. The special session was called, it was, it was overturned, and it went away. Why was 477 such trouble? Well, let me present this to you and think about this not so much as just me because I'm a journalist, but think about you and the effect it would have had you as John or Joan Q. Citizen. There were four things that were, were problems with it. The first is that it exempted whole categories of primary electronic communications from the statutory definition of record. You talked a lot about emails in the, in the panel session just before I came and spoke. But of course, keep in mind, you're talking to a guy who the world of technology has bypassed. I, for the longest time, thought a computer was nothing more than a typewriter with a television monitor on it. I still don't understand Instagram. I've been told all the time that I have friends following me on Pinterest. I have no idea what that is. I don't. <laughs> I struggle with Facebook and Twitter. Not really, I don't struggle with that. A big deal to me was when they had IBM Selectric typewriters. Anybody in here remember when those were introduced? Yeah. And then the little, you know, that was just to keep from the keys of the typewriter sticking. Now the little ball would go there and you could erase things, okay? So all kidding aside, the technology world went way beyond where it was in 1991 when Grandma was created. And therein lies what the legislative, legislature was concerned about. And, and somewhat rightfully so. Things that it were, you know, I, I'm from the day when if you had to have a note you want to give somebody a note, you pass them a note. You may have typed it, you may have hadn't written it out. You didn't send it electronically, it didn't come to their phone. It didn't do those kinds of things. And the legislature was concerned that there was a possible intrusion with emails and text messages and anything that they were doing in the course of business, public business or not, that anybody would have access to. It was a little bit of an overreaction. There was concern expressed that if somebody got a text from their spouse after they were leaving their office, would we as reporters or would the public be interested in it? It would automatically be scrutinized. It would be subject to investigation. I promise you, if I had gotten word that a text message was sent from somebody in government to their wife or vice versa that said, please stop at home and pick up a gallon of milk on the way home, I would not draw the conclusion that the man was receiving money from the Utah Dairy Commission. But that potential was there. They really wanted to take away all of that. So anything that was shared in a session, anything that was shared in a city council meeting, I mean, it goes way beyond just the legislature, anything that shared at all through text messages, all that subject to records, cautionary tale there, if you're on a city council, and as a reporter, I've sat in city council meetings, I've seen a presentation made, and I could tell that the councilmen were nodding off. And I could see one councilman reach for his phone, type something, I'd look across the room and I saw the other councilman going, whatever it was, be subject to record request. So be careful on that. Like David said earlier, David Fleming said earlier, manage your text messages and your emails. But there's a big concern about that. The second thing it did is it asked about um, broadening the definition of protected records. Now I will tell you, and, and Nova knows this, and all the people who are from archives know this, who sit on these on these state records committing meetings, this is one of the this is the one of the stickiest issues. Advertising or not determining what's protected. There are some def definitions, but there are some gray areas, and it's something we struggle with. And quite frankly, even though there are seven of us on the committee, we don't always agree. We don't always agree with each other. We still have a majority decision rule. What should be protected and what should be kept, what should be public and what should be private and what should be protected and what shouldn't be protected. It's, it's tough. Well, this, this 477, the way it was crafted, pretty much chopped everything in. As an example, you could not grandma and receive any kind of an impact about the performance of the legislators themselves. I can understand why they wouldn't want out there if somebody put something negative on there, but also you wouldn't be able to find out if it was a positive thing. Um, one area that was a big concern was require or keeping a legislator's requests of the Office of Fiscal Analysts private. In other words, if somebody had a bill that they wanted to be passed 
and the fiscal analyst did a report as to what the fiscal impact would be of that bill, well, they said, no, that should be protected. Nobody should be having access to that. In other words, we don't want you to know what it might cost us if we pass this bill, what it will cost the taxpayers. And of course, there was the other big concern that the governor's office, any decisions that he was contemplating that were considered complicated, none of that information would be available. The third change was regard to the fee structure. We talked about fee structure in here, or they talked about fee structure earlier in here. And I think to, again, what, what David and the rest of the panel said, with your entities, make sure whatever your fee schedule is that you've got it locked in because you don't want to be surprised and you don't want to come to the SRC asking us to determine whether it's fair or not fair or punitive or not punitive. But lock it in, but be, be, be reasonable. I've seen a couple of instances where I thought that the charge that certain entities were, were levying for a photocopy was a little outrageous. We figured out uh, one time that uh, based on the rate per page of this one entity and the person doing it, that the person making the photocopies was making somewhere between 80 and 90 bucks an hour. I immediately applied. <laughs> they weren't hiring because nobody would leave that kind of a job. <laughs> the first thing was the altering, uh, altering the burden of proof to challenge and appeal. So there were things that we were very uncomfortable with. The battle went on two weeks, but as I said, it had a happy ending, I guess a happy ending, as much as that the legislature went back into special session and they, and they decided to, to um, override or, you know, they, they reversed it is what I'm getting to say. Having said that, I think it did eyes, open the eyes to everybody, including those of us who are fans of open government, that grammar will always be a constant uh, work in, in, in progress. There'll be things that need to be changed. Just this session, House Bill 300 talked about um, body cam video, and you probably are aware about that, some of you, especially if you work in the police industry. The original plan, the original bill from what I was told was very restrictive, but the legislature worked this through, they came with a pretty good compromise, and there are times when body cam video will be protected, but there's other times when it will not be. By and large, I think what they came out with, with House Bill 300 was a good, was a good plan. So ultimately, what happened in 2011 really opened, and by the way, <laughs> not surprising to those of you who aren't fans of journalism, after the thing was reversed and after logic kicked in and after, I guess you could say, people came to their senses and that very restrictive grandma bill was uh, ousted and we went back to the system pretty much as it is now, did the national media continue to cover that story? No. They didn't. Not my fault. They weren't interested in the good part of that. They weren't interested in the reversal, just in the first part. So I realize in journalism, sometimes we make our own beds and we've alienated some people, and I understand that. Um, there are always challenges. There are always things that could be better. Has grammar been perfect? It has not. Has it led to, fix, fix, uh, to fishing expeditions? It absolutely has. I commented uh, before I came up today to a couple of people that, anybody here from Alta Township by chance? She left, <laughs> journalist is speaking, I'm toast, I'm out of here. From what I understand a few years ago, and I don't know how current it is, Alta Township, which I think is fairly small and probably doesn't have a big staff, maybe they don't even have an office, I don't know, but at any rate, I know there, were, there was a, a bombardment of grammar requests related to some water issue. This is kind of a, a legendary story uh, in, in the media and probably in government. Was that a five minute thing? Yes, I mean, oh, that was for the, your benefit, five minutes, so. Um, it absolutely, they absolutely got bombarded. And that's the kind of thing that's troublesome. So those of you who raised your hands and said that the media is kind of a pain sometimes, is it because you're bombarded with grammar requests? Yes? No, no, no. Or, or did your newspaper guy like mine throw your paper in the gutter a few times? Because it's happened to me a few times. So, um, It's been abused, and that's an issue. I don't think, again, by and large, journalists want to go on fishing expeditions. Have there been people who use grammar to get to have gotcha moments to elevate their careers? Absolutely. Not so much in this market, but in other markets. And we could talk a long time about reporters who've kind of abused their privilege 
And unfortunately, that taints all of us who are in it. But I think with grammar and with the, with the loopholes that are, are part of it, its intention is still very good and very solid. This is kind of my closing. I've told this many times. I've, I, I'm asked to speak quite often about journalism and the role in it and everything. And here's the thing that I emphasized, especially to people who are new and coming up in the industry. Journalists are storytellers. They should never be story makers. We shouldn't embellish the facts to make it more dramatic. We should never make up facts. The New York Times fired a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who wrote stories that were unbelievably dynamic and far reaching and amazing and motivational in all lies. Oh, there's that part. To tell a story, we have to be able to have the facts. If I wasn't a journalist, I'd still be a citizen. I'd still be a taxpayer. I still want to know that what my leaders are doing is right and above board, even if I don't agree with them all the time. I still like to know what they're doing. And I think as a, as a citizen, I have the right to know what they're doing. The way that most citizens are going to find out what their government is doing, if they don't go and sit in city council meetings, and not too many of you do, unless you're forced to because <laughs> it's your job, is you're going to find out through the media. And hopefully you're going to find out accurately through the media. But we can't tell a story if we don't have information. I do believe that communication is what leads to problem solving. And we can't communicate things if we don't know exactly what there is to communicate. So I apologize on the one hand to those of you who've had problems running afoul of journalists. But I don't apologize for the fact that as journalists, as our job, we're really trying to do, tell the stories that we feel the public needs to know. In the years that I've been a journalist, and, and unfortunately it has been 40 years, it is. We did accounting in an abacus in those days. We had, you know, and just like in those days, there wasn't much, to, much, much accounting to do. So. In the years that I've been a journalist, I've always believed that the stories that mattered, that I remember the most, were the stories that made a difference in someone's lives. And quite frankly, quite often they haven't been stories about city councils. They've been stories about somebody who, you know, maybe accomplished something amazing, overcame odds. I did a story once about a girl who spoke seven languages in her high school. She could speak seven languages fluently. The next year, that particular high school, which happened to be Davis High School, after her story was on the front page, had an increase of 20% of enrollment in their language classes. It didn't help the fact, it didn't hurt the fact that she also had a full ride scholarship to any country, any, any, almost any university in the country, which we talked about in the story. Now, I didn't do anything other than just tell her story. I was just the, the vehicle under which that story was told. That's what we should be able to do as journalists. So when we ask for things, trust me, if we're in, stepping in areas that are protected and inappropriate, then this hat comes off and the next hat I put on is going to be state records committee hat because you're going to repeal it. If, well, if it's denied, someone's going to appeal it. And you're going to have to come and defend it. There is a checks and balances system in here. But I do believe this. I believe that where there's transparency, there can be no places to hide. And hiding is the last thing that we want when it comes to public information. So uh, from that perspective, I don't, I'm not sure that we're going to necessarily have time for questions, nor many of you want to think. I'm just actually kind of going to dodge back behind here when I'm done here. But I really appreciate the fact that you've come to this, because I think this has been, this has been a great thing. When you're trying to understand grandma, and I applaud you for being here today, and thank you for inviting me, and I'm done.
thank you so much, Tom. That was very, very good. We thank you again for all coming. Um, look out in your emails for the survey that we will be sending out asking you how you enjoyed this conference and what you would like to learn in future conferences. Additionally, we will be sending out an announcement when conference materials are available on our website. So safe travels to you and enjoy your weekend.